Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek, where we discuss theology and apologetics from a charismatic perspective. Today I'm going to be responding to a recent video by Patrick Hines, a Presbyterian pastor who left the charismatic movement and is now, as he put it, a full-blown cessationist. He doesn't really do a lot of theology in his video. It's mostly his reflection on what he went through with charismatics and how that led him to conclude that it was basically all horse apples. But he did touch a bit on scripture too, so I thought that this would be a good opportunity to demonstrate for people how I address concerns like he raised. This is not meant to be contentious, and if he hadn't done his video, I would probably never have mentioned him by name. But since he did, I'm going to respond. In this first clip, Patrick recounts some experiences he had that started him down the road towards cessationism. I went to this uh, Pentecostal church in Williamsburg, Ohio, and it was pretty wild. People were running up and down the aisles, people waving their jackets around and jumping up and down and running around the sanctuary. And I remember a lady bounced up out of her chair right behind me, scared me half to death. She starts calling out in tongues and um, proceeded to interpret her own prophecy. And it was really strange. The message from God was, I am the Lord, I am in this place. I am the Lord, I am in this place. I am the Lord, I am in this place. And I shall be praised in this place. And I shall be praised in this place. And these praises shall be sung in this place. And these praises shall be sung in this place. And then she sat down. And I thought, hmm, hmm. And that's really when the uncertainty and doubt really started. There was a vineyard church in the area that I went to a couple times. And this is in the 1990s, so this is like 90, 94, 95, 96. That was during the time when the Toronto thing was going on, and then later the, the Brownsville revival was in the 90s. And there was this outbreak of what they called holy laughter. And I remember standing there in the sanctuary of that vineyard church. And then I saw this. This was new for me, too. I'd never seen this before. The minister stood up in front of the congregation, just had his hands held out like this, and just kept saying the phrase, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. And then some lady in the front row started laughing. And I mean laughing really loud. And the pastor started laughing. And while he's laughing, it's more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. And then more people start laughing and laughing and laughing. And then there's all these people laughing. And then some of them fell down, were shaking on the floor. And I really started thinking, is this really a move of the God who gave us the Bible? What he just shared is common to pretty much everybody in the charismatic movement. We all see things that seem weird and extreme. We all have questions and reservations. So what happens at that point is that some just accept what is happening as the work of God and choose to participate. Some, like me, choose not to participate, but remain continuationist in our theology and charismatic in our practice. And some, like Patrick, just decide to chunk it all and become cessationists. None of this really proves anything one way or the other except that different people react differently to the same experiences. You can apply the same logic to Christianity itself, and many have. They see a minister fall into sin and they conclude that all preachers are hypocrites, and then they walk away from the faith. Or maybe they encounter abusive leaders and they conclude that the Jesus that they preach about, the Jesus of love, he's not really even real. Or they encounter problematic theology and conclude that Christianity doesn't make sense. Others react to all of those things by pressing in and putting more faith in God and his word and less faith in people. Again, the fact that people react differently doesn't prove anything from a theological standpoint. In this clip, he talks about the sovereignty of God and eternal security. As I was reading my Bible, I was starting to see more and more and more things like God is sovereign over everything. And I was starting to see more and more 
um, things that were contrary to the Wesleyan tradition, which this guy was educated in, like you can lose your salvation. I remember he and I used to go round and round and round about that. And I just, I could not understand how this man actually thought he was saved if you could do something to lose it. And I, I would always tell him if there's something that I have to do to either keep my salvation or something I have to refrain from doing to, to maintain it, then I have no doubt that I'm, I'm going to lose it. Probably never had it at all because I knew how sinful that I was. Okay, the implication here, I guess, is that charismatics don't believe in the sovereignty of God, which is nonsense. All Christians believe that God is sovereign. I mean, if you confess that Jesus is the risen Lord, you are saying that he is God, and God is the ultimate authority, which is the definition of sovereign. But not all Christians see the same implications to God's sovereignty. Some Calvinists believe that because God is sovereign, he's meticulously orchestrating and causing everything that happens in the universe, including our sins and judgment for those sins. Deists believe that God is sovereign, but he quit caring about what happens right after he created man, and we're pretty much on our own. And in between those two extreme views, there's a spectrum of views among both charismatics and non-charismatics about how God's sovereignty impacts our lives. So just saying God is sovereign doesn't really mean much more than saying the sky is blue. And as for the once saved, always saved issue, on one hand, you've got Pentecostals who believe that you have to get saved over and over every time you sin. And on the other hand, you have charismatics who believe in eternal security. And in between, you have people like me who believe that you don't lose your free will when you're born again. And that there's always the possibility that if you start down the road toward unbelief, you could eventually walk away from the faith and forfeit your salvation. And you have a similar range of views in the non-charismatic world. So I don't really see the relevance of that observation. Being a Presbyterian, you would assume that he believes in unconditional election, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, which would explain why he takes issue with the Wesleyan view of conditional election. But again, this isn't really a charismatic versus non-charismatic issue. In the next clip, he talks about speaking in tongues. I discovered and saw clearly tongues are actually languages. They're human languages. It's not the tongues of angels or anything like that. Even um, when angels do speak in scripture, they always speak in known human languages. But the idea that tongues of angels, that, that phrase in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, really all that, that's just a prophetic hyperbole. Uh, talking about just basically saying, if I have the, the ability to speak every language in the world all the way up to the highest heaven, even the tongues of angels, it's not saying that gibberish is what angels speak, and therefore we have a license to, to speak syllables that don't mean anything. That's not what that's talking about. Tongues are real languages. And I knew for a fact that nothing I had ever heard in uh, charismatic circles or at the vineyard or at that Pentecostal church or at the Charismatic United Methodist Church. I knew none of that was really from God. Sometimes when people say, I know for a fact, what they really mean is that they're totally convinced based on the information they have, totally disregarding the fact that that information might be wrong or that they might be operating under a flawed premise. I have personally heard people say, I know for a fact when I actually knew the facts firsthand <laughs> that they were wrong about. When Patrick says he knows for a fact that nothing that he heard in those churches was from God, I think his reason for saying that is his presupposition that tongues in the Bible were always human languages. Cessationists will insist that on the day of Pentecost, the believers were speaking human languages. But were they? Let's look at the text. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitudes came together, 
and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said they are full of new wine. The most commonly held view is that the believers were speaking unlearned human languages, but the text doesn't really say that. It says other tongues. Consider this. Verse 5 says that there were people from every nation, and then a dozen different regions were mentioned in the following verses. If 120 people were speaking 120 different languages at the same time, how would you understand them? 1 Corinthians 14.2 says that when you speak in tongues, no one understands you. You're speaking mysteries in the Spirit. I believe that tongues is always exercised that way, but it's not always perceived that way. What I mean by that is that the people who hear you won't be able to understand you unless God gives them that ability to understand. I believe that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Jews who came to Jerusalem for Pentecost heard in their own languages, but that doesn't mean that the believers were actually speaking those languages. That would explain why some people thought that they were just drunk and were babbling gibberish. They probably weren't granted the ability to understand. I'm not dogmatic about this. The Bible doesn't really explain how all of this works. I started speaking in tongues nearly 50 years ago, and it's still a mystery to me. The point I'm making here is that the belief that tongues in the Bible were always unlearned human languages is a presumption that could very well be wrong. And if it is wrong, it would also be wrong to conclude, based on that presumption, that the tongues that charismatics are speaking today aren't of God. And as for the tongues of angels comment, Job 38 says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the angels were around when the earth was created, and they shouted for joy and sang. Do you suppose that maybe they could communicate with each other before human languages developed? Paul may indeed have been using hyperbole, but the fact that he mentioned angelic languages tells us that they don't just speak human languages. But it's just as plausible that Paul wasn't using hyperbole, given what the book of Job says. Matt Slick from the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry says, It would appear that angels do have languages, since they are intelligent beings, self-aware, and communicate. We know they can speak in human languages, as was the case in biblical times with Abraham and Gideon, Joseph, etc. We also have a statement by Paul that says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. This could mean that there are multiple tongues of men and various tongues of angels, or tongues, plural, of both men and angels, where there is only one angelic language. We don't know for sure. Nevertheless, it seems evident from Scripture that angels have languages. And Akarm is one of the most popular apologetic sites on the web. Now, while Matt Slick is a continuationist, I don't think anybody would lump him together with practicing charismatics. The pseudepigraphical book, The Testament of Job, makes reference to an angelic dialect. But of course, pseudepigraphical books and apologists aren't as authoritative as Scripture, and scripture isn't really clear on this. So this is kind of like debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. In other words, it's a pointless debate. In the next clip, Patrick says that the biblical standard for prophecy is perfection. The standard for prophecy is that you have to get it right. 
every time. If you tell someone something's going to happen and you say, thus saith the Lord, uh, not only is it a sin to you if that doesn't happen, but in the Old Testament, it was a crime and a capital one at that. And the thing is, the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles do not give us a new definition of prophecy that allows it to be wrong. Well, if you're going to maintain the Old Testament standard for prophecy, you should probably also maintain the Old Testament standard for dealing with false prophecies, which is death. Are cessationists going to advocate for the execution of false prophets? No. So what are you going on about? You obviously recognize that the Old Testament and the New Testament have different rules, applications, and expectations. Cessationists are quick to point out that tithing isn't a New Testament concept, and I agree. Many charismatics agree. In the Old Covenant, they had prophets, priests, judges, and kings. Do we have priests in the New Covenant? Well, Catholics do, but evangelicals don't, because we're all priests in the New Covenant. Do we have judges? Not in the church. We have judges in our legal system, but in the New Covenant, we all have the Holy Spirit and we can all judge truth from error and right from wrong. Do we have kings? Well, some countries have a monarchy, but we don't have kings in the church because we're all kings and priests, according to Revelation 1.6. So why do cessationists insist that New Testament prophets are just like Old Testament prophets? Old Testament prophets spoke to Israel about national matters like war, sin, and repentance. New Testament prophets speak to the church for exhortation, edification, and comfort. In the Old Testament, they were to execute prophets if they got a prophecy wrong. In the New Testament, we're told to let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. We're also told to quench not the spirit and despise not prophesyings. The implication being that many believers back then did in fact despise the gift of prophecy because so many prophecies turned out wrong. Paul tells them instead to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. He doesn't say to stone those who give a false prophecy. He doesn't say to brand them as false prophets or kick them out of the church or anything like that. Again, under the new covenant, many things have changed. There's no more animal sacrifices. There's no more Sabbath requirements. There's no more stonings. The church is not here to condemn and kill people, but to take the gospel of reconciliation to the whole world, to make disciples and build the kingdom of God on earth. I've actually heard the guys on Remnant Radio <clears throat> um, try to say that Jeremiah wasn't sure about uh, one of his specific prophecies that he gave in uh, Chris Roseboro at um, Pirate Christian media destroyed that idea. Um, but yeah, if you understand Hebrew really at all, um, it's not saying, then I knew it was the word of the Lord, as if there was uncertainty before. That's just a, a basic biblical Hebrew. Um, that's not, not it at all. In that Chris Roseboro video, he said that Jeremiah 32 8 really means, then I knew that this is what Yahweh was talking about. But I couldn't find any translation that supported Chris's version. And G. Campbell Morgan and John Calvin seem to confirm the Remnant Radio guy's take. I did a video on this that I've linked to in the description. Patrick then says that charismatics are wrong about Christians having a demon. A Christian has been delivered from the dominion of darkness, Colossians 1.13 says. And that the Holy Spirit of God is the down payment of our redemption. He indwells us. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon and cannot have demons in them or anything like that. The Greek word that is used 13 times in the New Testament for demon possessed is demonazenai. I think I said that right, which means that the person is demonized or inhabited by a demon. But there are also 16 references to a person having a demon, and twice we read that a person was with a demon. There's also one reference to a person being vexed with a demon. What these verses tell us is that there are varying degrees of demonic influence that can be manifested and where deliverance can be ministered. You might recall that some people that Jesus healed had devils. So demons don't just attack a person's mind or spirit they can also attack the body. 
Do we conclude that a deaf or mute person or an epileptic must not be a Christian? After all, Jesus cast devils out of people like that. The, the Bible doesn't really lay out for us the levels of demonic influence or oppression. It also doesn't say specifically that a Christian can't have a demon. It does say that Jesus cast seven devils out of Mary Magdalene, but it doesn't tell us whether or not she was a believer at the time. Sometimes Christians just want to approach topics like this in a textbook fashion where everything is written out for us with great specificity. But the Bible doesn't usually work that way. That's why we need to rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit and the gift of discerning of spirits. Here's how you know when the Holy Spirit's present, where Christ is being preached. That's where the Holy Spirit is. And you know, that's what was always missing in those charismatic churches. Jesus just not talked about much. At least wasn't in my experience. Okay, that was his experience. And I won't deny that there are plenty of charismatic churches that are out of balance in this area. But my experience is that many Pentecostals and Charismatics do preach Jesus. My Bapticostal friend Scott Kemp is a great evangelistic preacher. These days he spends more time in Ghana than in the United States because God called him there to win Africans to Jesus in the power of the Spirit. Daniel Kalenda is a fifth generation Pentecostal and he's a dynamic evangelist whose ministry has brought millions to Jesus. When I left the Baptist Church and started attending an Assembly of God Church back in the 70s, my pastor, Carl Alcorn, had a background as an evangelist, and he was a passionate preacher of the gospel. Jack Hayford was Pentecostal, and he wrote hundreds of worship songs exalting Jesus, including Majesty. For 10 years here in Tulsa, I attended Bob Yandian's church, and he always brought the message back to the gospel. Georgian Banoff is about as charismatic as they come, and he's always exalting Jesus. So while there are many immature Christian leaders who are obsessed with the supernatural in an unhealthy way, there are plenty who strive for balance as they teach on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And for what it's worth, there are plenty of Reformed churches that are out of balance and never mention the love of God, the goodness of God, or the desire of God to have fellowship with His children. It's all wrath, depravity, and sola scriptura. So how is that any better than charismania? You know, all the messages, all the prophetic words, all of the words of knowledge that were shared with me from the Holy Spirit, all the messages directly from God, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord gave me this word. Not one of them, not one ever had anything to do with convicting anybody of sin, nor did they ever have anything to do with bearing witness to the Lord Jesus Christ as the only salvation of sinners. Okay, let's look at some prophetic utterances in the book of Acts. Agabus prophesied that a famine was coming. Did that convict anybody of sin? Did it bear witness to Jesus? No, but it did help the believers to anticipate what was coming so that they could provide for those in Judea who were impacted the most. On another occasion, Agabus prophesied that Paul would be bound in Jerusalem and handed over to the Gentiles. Where's the conviction of sin there, or the witness to Jesus? Certainly, prophecies can address sin or bear witness to Jesus, but there's no biblical basis for saying that they always have to. Again, he who prophesies speaks unto men for exhortation, edification, and comfort. You might be exhorted to remain faithful during a trial, or you might be exhorted to get the sin out of your life. Both would be edifying. So if you're truly trying to be biblical, you have to allow for the fact that prophecy isn't required to address sin or directly testify of Jesus. How do you know if a pastor's spirit-filled? Not because he acts weird, and not because he talks weird, but because he preaches Christ. Peter says, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. 
This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And then he goes on to say, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, the next verse shows you the work of the Spirit. Listen. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Not, they all broke out in holy laughter. Or they all got slain in the spirit and fell down and passed out for 15 minutes. Not, they all started writhing around the ground and shaking and barking like dogs or clucking like chickens. They were cut to the heart. You know what that means? That means the Holy Spirit opened their eyes to see how sinful they really are, were, and they passed the same judgment upon themselves that the scripture passed. Well, I think we should make a distinction here between an evangelistic message like Peter gave at Pentecost and a believer's meeting where the gifts are in operation as we see described in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. You wouldn't preach an evangelistic message or expect the same response in a believer's meeting that you would in an encounter like they had at the temple at Pentecost. And for the record, there's nothing in Acts 2 about the Holy Spirit showing them how sinful they are. Peter's message was about their rejection of Jesus. They crucified their Messiah, but God raised him from the dead in fulfillment of prophecy, and the signs they were seeing testified to his resurrection. The Jews who were listening to Peter were cut to the heart over their rejection of their Messiah, not their lying, drinking, smoking, cursing, fornicating, etc. Their sins had been paid for by Jesus. The only reason that they were under condemnation at that point was because they hadn't believed in Jesus, which is what 3,000 of them then chose to do. What is amazing to me is that the early Pentecostals under um, Charles Fox Parham and William Seymour, um, they had a biblical understanding of what tongues was. They thought it was real languages. And in fact, Agnes Osman, one of Charles Fox Parham's students, really believed she was speaking Chinese and actually thought she could write Chinese too. And you know how they found out they couldn't speak Chinese or write Chinese? They actually went to China and went on the streets and realized they weren't speaking Chinese. And here's the, the part that's so sad to me. Did they therefore say, you know what, we got caught up in the hysteria and in the religious fervor, and yeah, we were just totally wrong, we were self-deceived. No, they didn't do that. They redefined tongues as unintelligible gibberish. Well, it's true that Parham believed that tongues was the ability to preach the gospel in an unlearned language, but if you study the book of Acts, you don't see anybody preaching the gospel via the gift of tongues. At Pentecost, they were telling of the wondrous works of God. That's not necessarily the gospel. If you talk about God creating the universe and creating man in his image and delivering Israel from Egypt and defeating the Philistines, that's all good, but it doesn't tell you how to get saved. They didn't hear the gospel until Peter preached. And Peter wouldn't have needed to preach in tongues because they all had one or two common languages. What Parham and other Pentecostal leaders did was go back to the Bible and discover that 1 Corinthians 14.2 says that when you speak in tongues, nobody understands you. So they modified their Pentecostal views accordingly. We all have skeletons in our theological closets. Lutherans had to abandon the anti-Semitic views of their founder. The Southern Baptists have forsaken the pro-slavery views of their founders. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that there was some tweaking early on to Pentecostal theology, especially when you consider the fact that most of the church had abandoned the gifts through most of church history. These Pentecostal pioneers were pretty much starting from scratch. It's experience that unites these people, not truth. And you need to understand, unity that's not based on doctrinal truth is not unity at all. 
It's not unity at all. Our experiences take a back seat to the word of God. My experience always is under the authority of and correction of the word of God. Like I said earlier, he spent most of this video talking about his experiences and how these experiences led him to his current views. So I find it odd that he then invokes experience as the reason us charismatics believe the way that we do. That's often the case with cessationists. They haven't seen anybody get healed, so they don't believe in the gift of healing. They haven't heard a legitimate, accurate prophecy, so they dismiss prophecy. They haven't seen a devil cast out, so they reject deliverance. But when you press them on it, many of them will admit that there's no specific verse in the New Testament that says that the gifts have ceased. And in this final clip, Patrick tells you what all is required for you to be a minister of the gospel. If you're a minister, you got to learn the languages. You got to learn how to do exegesis. You have to study church history, historical theology, systematic theology. You got to understand the Reformation. You got to understand theological trends and movements. It's a monumental task. Yikes. If only Jesus had known all of that before choosing all of those uneducated fishermen as his disciples. Thanks for watching. Be blessed.